Hello, everyone. How are you? Thank you all for coming. My name is Evan Bernstein. I'm the co-host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe radio show and podcast. It is my distinct pleasure to be moderating this very special panel, which is titled Skeptics in the Dojo, Taking on the Martial Arts. So why don't we get right to it? You know, I'll start with a few opening remarks. It's uh, the one... We all know that the wonderful thing about skepticism is that it can be applied to just about any aspect of your life. And the martial arts is certainly no exception to that. It's something that many people uh, have had some sort of experience with, either directly or indirectly. You've either taken classes yourself, or your children have taken classes, or you have another relative who is in the martial arts. Everybody, I think everybody in this room understands what I'm saying. They have that sort of either first-hand experience or a direct relationship with someone who has. And when we put the martial arts through the filter of skepticism, what comes out on the other end is often surprising and sometimes ugly <laughs> when it comes right down to it. But this should come as no surprise to, I think, the people in this room. Um, while the Amazing Meeting has covered many topics uh, over the past decade or so that these meetings have been happening, there has not been one that is really focused on the martial arts, but that is until today. S seated here before you uh, are some very prominent skeptics, but what you probably may or may not know is that, uh, by my calculations, there's over 100 years of martial arts experience up on this stage right now. And uh, it's a virtual treasure trove of uh, first-hand accounts and expertise, the likes of which has not been gathered before at a skeptic conference, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, so by contrast, I myself have only been in the martial arts since 2008. So I'm really relatively new, I think, when it comes to this. But I wanted to give you just kind of a brief understanding of my experience, my brief experience in the martial arts. I train in a discipline called Krav Maga. Krav Maga is the official Israeli Defense Force self-defense system. Uh, it's what the uh, army teaches both their uh, soldiers and the civilian population of Israel in order to defend themselves in the streets against attacks. Um, it does not contain some of the things that you find in the more traditional martial arts. There are no katas. There are no forms. Uh, we don't have competitions. We don't right, enter rings for, uh, for uh, sport. What it is, it is a pure fight for your life self-defense system. In other words, if somebody puts their hands on you in a violent way, Krav Maga is there to help you defend yourself against that. Or what happens if you're in a parking lot late at night and someone approaches you with a knife? Or what happens if you're in your home and there's a home invasion and somebody's got a gun and you've got loved ones in the other room or children upstairs asleep? How do you react to these situations? This is what Krav Maga teaches us how to deal with real life scenarios. It's an added, when you, it's an added bonus, I think, to realize that with Krav Maga, they've been able to change over the years. It's about been around for about 80 years. But when new evidence comes along, or when they realize that there's a better way of doing something, they adapt. They actually change their techniques in order to go with better techniques. They discard the old, what used to work, they go with what is now a better technique. And isn't that science? I mean, really, isn't that the heart of what science is about? I think what Carl Sagan once said, to be able to do away with your old beliefs and replace it with the new knowledge that we've learned. And that's exactly what I derive from Krav Maga. It's one of the reasons why uh, I find it so appealing. I've been exposed to things in our studio, um, which I'm afraid to say um, have been less than scientific. Uh, I've seen the concept of chi brought up in our studio, and I've also been exposed to some uh, nutritional claims and uh, supplements and those sorts of things that have been on our shelves. But I'm also pl uh, pleased to say that in the light of real evidence of these things, uh, my master instructor no longer uses uh, or no longer relies on these things as part of his program. So I have to give kudos and props where props are due in this regard. So that's been my brief experience, but uh, 
the people to my right here are the ones who are going to really elaborate for you uh, much more than I can about the intersections of martial arts and skepticism. So please allow me a minute to introduce the panelists. First, directly to my right. For 15 years, he was Scientific American's editor-in-chief, and in 2000, he was a recipient of the Sagan Award for the Public Understanding of Science bestowed by the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. He is the host of the Weather Channel's 2013 miniseries, Hacking the Planet, and just one, it's just one of his many television credits. Please welcome John Rennie. And seated to John's right, he is the host of the Hayam Martial Arts Podcast. Hiya! <laughs> that is a show dedicated to the promotion of skepticism and rational thinking in the martial arts, amongst many other things. He is a, long, he is a lifelong practitioner of the uh, Bagao and Ching Yi disciplines. Please welcome David Jones. To David's right, she is no stranger to Tam Goers. She is the author of popular science books for the public, including Me, Myself, and Why, Searching for the Science of the Self, and The Calculus Diaries, How Math Can Help You Lose Weight, Win in Vegas, and Survive the Zombie Apocalypse. Those are all things we can relate to here right now. Her work has appeared in many magazines and newspapers. Her blog appears uh, in, uh, at the Siam website. It's titled Cocktail Party Physics. Please welcome Jennifer Ouellette. <laughs> to Jennifer's right, he is a professional welterweight MMA fighter fighting in the Bellator MMA League. He is an active member of the skeptical community and proudly adorns the JREF logo on his fight shorts. He holds a record of 21 wins, 8 losses, and 1 draw. He stands at 6 feet 0 inches, weighing in at 170 pounds. Please welcome Brent Weedman. And finally, the next gentleman to his right is a protege of James Randi, an accomplished magician, a jazz musician, and he holds the title of Sipu, a title he earned from Grandmaster Chan, who trained alongside Bruce Lee. He has been teaching Wing Chun Kung Fu in Honolulu since 1994. Please welcome S.F. Ziegler. And this is the point where I'm going to kind of let them take over. We're all going to have some comments to make along the way. But first up in round one is John Rennie. Take it away, John. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I may need the uh, changer there. If you oh, yes. yes. No, thank you. Um, anyway, um, right. So, you know, martial arts is, is inspirational to a lot of different sorts of people and, and very uh, impressive uh, in, in many ways as well, obviously. Um, a lot of what impresses people who are in the martial arts, but maybe especially some of the ones who are outside of it, is the power that they can sometimes associate with it. They, they can sometimes look at it and think, well, it seems like these people who have been training in the martial arts are doing some things that seem absolutely superhuman. And it's, it's the scale of those kinds of, of techniques, particularly sometimes some of the, the power that's in, involved in them, um, that, that maybe has, has helped to support in some people's minds the idea that there is some kind of mystical, magical force uh, that those years of training and you know, ancient Eastern arts has somehow brought you. Um, this is not the case, however. The, what people don't realize is that all of these amazing uh, feats that are accomplished in the martial arts are accomplished through the magic of science. And in fact, very particularly, um, a lot of times the physics and biomechanics. And so I'm just very briefly going to touch on a couple of items of what often uh, impresses people and just let's just glancingly look at some of the science of what's involved in that. Um, one of the big categories of things that, that uh, impresses a lot of people is, is breaking. Um, you'll see in martial arts demonstrations, people will break all kinds of things. You'll see them break boards like this. You'll see them break ice. You'll see them break uh, cinder block material, rocks, break all kinds of different things. These things are, are 
in many cases, it's quite hard. These, some of these breaks, I actually don't want to take too much away from them. A lot of people, if you just walked up and tried to do this, you could seriously mess yourself up um, in, in, in the process. That said, these are demonstrations. And they are demonstrations, which means that some of the actual skill and strength involved that people do hone in the course of the martial arts training that they get is used to best effect. It's presented in a way that makes it look as impressive as it possibly could. Hence the example of something like when people are breaking boards. It's not just a random choice. They're not just you know, ripping a board off the side of a house and then splintering it further with their hands. They're taking something like this. Now this is a standard board. It is a, a piece of uh, basically 12 inch by 1 inch by 10 inch lumber. It is cut to these specifications actually um, quite deliberately. Actually, it's strictly speaking, it's a little smaller than that in all of those dimensions. It's not really 1 inch thick. It's actually about 3 quarters of an inch, maybe about 2 centimeters thick. And you like to have it as thin as it can if you want to have it impressive. It also makes a difference uh, that it is you know that it is pine um, and that it is basically a dry piece of pine. Um, that it is in good, you'll notice that it also it does not have any knots in it. All of this is very well calculated because wood is an amazingly sturdy material. But as you all know, wood also consists of cellulose fibers, and which means the fibers themselves are very very strong, but the cement, the sap. The material that holds those fibers next to one another is much, much weaker. So when someone is breaking a board, they're hitting it in such a way that they are breaking it along the grain. Now, that even that can actually still be hard, depending on the number of boards that are involved, but you are basically you know, it's, you, are, you are breaking it the way it naturally wants to break, so that it is as impressive as it can possibly be. Now, consider just actually how much force has to be involved in this. I mean, you could still say, well, still, you know, even given that, you know, hand soft, bored, hard, but, but, <laughs> but this is where we start to get into actually some of the other kinds of physics involved. And, and the important thing to remember uh, with, with something like breaking is what is the key is how much power is actually delivered to the board. And what matters there is actually the, the physical property of what's, of what's called impulse, which is basically the change in momentum. How much, as a hand is passing through the board, how much the hand, uh, its momentum changes, because that reflects how much power is being delivered into it. And basically, um, that basically that's a reflection of how heavy the striking thing is, for example, a fist or a forearm or whatever else, um, how fast it's moving, and then how thick the object is, how far it's moving down through all of that. And you can do sort of the simple calculations. This basically sets the, that, that, in fact, if you take a fist, which weighs, you know, and sort of a fist and forearm, which together weigh about two kilograms, and if you drive it down through a board like this, and it's, you start off moving at about 10 meters a second, which is probably a little fast, but it's good enough for these calculations, two centimeter thick board, it generally be, um, can actually have a level of, of, of uh, distortion that can bend about one centimeter, so it's about three. Basically, that sets up that that translates out to roughly 10 to the fourth newtons or something on the order of a ton of force. It's a ton of weight. Well, if a ton of weight was suddenly going to be balanced on this, and bear in mind it's coming down over just the tiny few square inches of the fist that's actually making contact, you bet that board's going to break. Science says that's going to do that. Now, this is probably the right moment for all of you to get that Mr. Miyagi moment like out of your hand and saying, board does not hit back. Um, <laughs> And because you say, yes, what about actual striking? What about actual fighting? And you know, that's the, the, the fist. I mean, you see people delivering very, very hard punches. And how do they manage to actually do that? It's actually a, sort of an intriguing study that came out with this just at the end of last year that was uh, published uh, by a Morgan and Carrier. Oh, sorry, I'll do this, this very, very quickly. The, the, uh, the key thing is that these, these two uh, scientists at the University of Utah decided to study the, the human fist and uh, uh, is part of the idea that maybe people actually sort of evolved to be able to uh, fight more effectively. Now, we can maybe we'll get a chance to talk about whether or not that's really a credible hypothesis. But here's the interesting thing about the human fist. I don't know if you're aware of this. In the entire animal kingdom, we're the only ones that can make a fist like this. We're very unusual because chimpanzees and gorillas, other primates, a curious thing is that because of the proportions of their hands, they cannot make a fist like this. 
They can fold over their, their fingers, but they can't fold over their fingers and put the fingertips down into the palm the way that we can. John, you're saying it's good for climbing, not for punching. Good for climbing, not for punching, right. study, which is part of what they actually then sort of establish. They have strong prehensile grips, and they don't, but they don't have a good precision grip. What they also don't have is the same kind of punching fist that we have, which is they can't fold their fingers over like this. They can't also buttress the thumb against the fingers in this way. Um, this sort of, so what these, uh, these researchers decided to do was they decided to study the effect of different, uh, different shapes of fist to get a sense of whether or not this would have mattered. They had 12 martial artists hit various things and they monitored the forces and they had people use a proper fist like this. They had ones that would be sort of more, a little bit uh, of, of a fist that's kind of a hybrid between what a chimpanzee could hit with and what we could hit with, where at least the fingers were doubled into the fingers, uh, d doubled into the palm, and then this kind of bad fist where it's just folded over like this. And what they discovered is that basically, if you hit like this, please don't hit like this because, well, you will, you will hurt your hand. Um, you want to hit something more like this with the true proper fist such that these carpal bones of your hand are lining up here with the other long bones of your arm and you want to be able to have a straight uh, striking surface, what in Japanese they would call seiken. Um, and here's the thing of what that was interesting about what they study. They determined that being able to fold your fingertips into the palm of your hand doubles the stability of this knuckle joint. And buttressing the thumb against it doubles that again. So by being able to do this, you are able to make your fist a much sturdier, much more stable, solid thing with which to hit someone else. Which means that when you do something like try to hit a board or an opponent, you can hit it much, much harder without risking breaking your hand. At least because these will be as well supported as they are. Um, we'll maybe have a chance to sort of discuss whether or not um, the human hand is really ideal for being able to do a lot of that. But uh, with that, let me just sort of open up to the discussion with the rest of the panel on some of those subjects. Well, two quick questions for you. One, uh, how important is spacing? in the amount of things that are broken. And the other one is how important is conditioning before you start doing this sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely, very, very important, right. Um, we'll, we'll do some demonstrations of, of breaking a little bit, a little bit later, but um, sometimes when there are like multiple boards, you can put one board right against the next, or what you will often see is that people will sometimes put uh, the boards atop one another, and they will separate it with something that look like little spacers, basically pencils. Um, Having the, that space hugely makes a difference because it then means that you are not doubling up the force that you need to be able to have to go through those boards with every single time. You actually don't have to double it up even when you just use two boards over one, but you really don't have to double it up because when you have the separation. And that's because you actually then have the value of, of the descending broken piece of wood to help hit the next piece of wood down underneath it. So that actually hugely increases it. And so the, the picture that I showed there where somebody was breaking, I think, like eight boards, there were set spacers in there, which made it really easy for him to just chop right through it. And you do want to have some level of conditioning at least at the level of being able to, to make sure that they are doing something with the right kind of technique. I mean, uh, the fact is, it would probably be really easy to take almost anyone with just a little bit of coaching, have them break a single good clean board very, very quickly. But you do want to make sure that they're just hitting it exactly the right way so that they don't risk hurting well, their arm. More structure than having thick callus pads. That's right, okay. yeah, that kind of thing. Yep, very important with that. Um, I was, uh, here's a son. I was going to make one point was that there is a sense in physics where boards do hit back. Yes. I mean, which is this equal, <laughs> this equal and opposite reaction thing. And, and I think of this all the time because uh, um, anyone who's ever seen someone screw up a flying sidekick against a much larger opponent, what happens is the, is the, you know, the energy that they're trying to transfer to their opponent actually ends up reflecting back this equal and opposite reaction, and they bounce off. Um, we actually tried to do this once. I saw it in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and went down to my dojo and said, we got to try this. I want to see if this works. And we found that all my friend had to do was simply just do this. And that's all it took to uh, change the equations so that I would bounce off. 
Um, so generally, you don't want to do a double flying sidekick, I think, is a lesson. Yeah, I, I, very early on in things, I, I was involved in, in a demonstration, and I had like two boards that were doubled up, and I, you know, slammed into it, and my hand bounced off of it like a ping pong ball, at which point my instructor looked it over and said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great big knot in that one. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't want to hit that board at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the boards do hit back, action and reaction. Okay, great. Why don't we uh, move along then? Okay. Let's advance the, uh, the next slide. Round two. David, take us away. All right. Well, um, I'm sure a lot of you <clears throat> have no idea who I am and why I'm up here. So real quickly, my bona fides. As far as traditional martial arts go, practiced for many years. Um, and this image here should show you how high my stance work skill got. Um, I'll leave that to all the skeptics in the audience to figure out how that was done, but I was holding that posture. We'll just leave that at that. <laughs> um, also, I'm one of those traditionalists who uh, actually believes that you need some fighting in your martial arts to be any good at it, um, and there's proof of that. <laughs> I have a picture like that on my Facebook page, in fact. <laughs> We actually used to do these a lot when I was younger. It's tapered off a little now that I'm middle-aged and have children, but uh, they were smokers or what we call tequila sparring nights. And if you think that was a one-time thing, uh, my girlfriend at the time, look at her face. You can tell I came home like that a lot. Anyway, that's enough of that introduction. What I've decided to do for you folks, let me get this right, is uh, come up with something dressed up in uh, martial numerology and mystical terminology that, that you could still identify with as skeptics. So when we're looking at Wu in traditional martial arts, the first thing I have for you is the five martial fallacies, okay? Fallacy number one, the wooden dummy. Uh, this can be a straw man or a non sequitur, depending on how you look at it, but basically what it is, is the idea that if you only punch and kick air, or if you only tangle with wooden people, then you're only qualified to punch and kick air or tangle with wooden people. Any martial art, traditional or otherwise, should have some component of hands-on with another human being. So if you're shopping for a martial art, you walk into tr traditional school, and you notice no one ever touches anyone else, they just wave their arms and stuff in the air, you might want to look elsewhere if you're concerned at all with learning how to fight or defend yourself. Um, number two. Ancient Chinese secret. Can anybody guess what that would be? Argument from antiquity. <laughs> you see the game I'm playing here now, don't you? <laughs> um, so virtually every style, as traditional as it is, was either created or codified within the last 200 years or so. Um, some styles have roots that go back further, but the versions that you see now are not ancient, okay? And this is a good thing because People a thousand years ago dealt with different political climates, different social situations, and very different worlds than we deal with in the modern age. And styles that were codified in you know, the 19th and 20th century uh, are actually gonna speak to us more because those times are more similar to what we deal with. So any school that's gonna be relying on uh, Great Grandmaster Jong or whatever from a thousand years ago did or said so and so, don't worry about that so much. <laughs> That's apocryphal and it has nothing to do with what they're going to teach you today. Um, number three, just to keep it at a gallop, the golden carp. Any guesses? Red herring. Okay. <laughs> Basically, the golden carp in martial arts fallacies is lineages, titles, belts, uh, fancy Chinese wall hanging, uh, diplomas, patches, you name it, all this stuff in and of itself has very little to do with whether what's going on is any good or not. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some very hard-won black belts. You look at something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu nowadays, it takes eight, ten years to earn a black belt if you're really going at it hard. And, you know, so there are some systems that are very serious about doling these things out. There are other systems, though, that if you punch the clock and pay the fees, you will have your black belt in two years. That black belt is not worth the belt it's printed on, okay? <laughs> so um, always be on the lookout for that. I have to move my head away from the microphone because I can't read this close anymore. <sighs> Let me scoot that out. Okay, number four, no true ninja. 
<laughs> this is the no true Scotsman after a fashion. Um, basically, this is something you'll see people use to cover for inadequacies or uh, missing parts of the systems they teach. Now, before I say this, let me say that no system teaches everything, nor should they try to. Specialization is a good thing. But if you say, um, hey, uh, Mr. Tai Chi guy, why don't we ever see any sparring in class? Well, no true Tai Chi man would lower himself to that sort of brutality. You might want to get a little suspicious. Uh, you know, um, hey, karate guy, why don't you ever do any competitions? Well, you know, a true karate man is too deadly for the ring. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> So watch out, because these are things I hear people say all the time. Oh, we don't do this. This art's too deadly. Mm, eh, yeah. Uh, if, again, if you're only punching and kicking air, how do you even know? So that's the no true ninja. All right, number five, and this is the one that's the biggest minefield for skeptics if you're training around traditionalists. And uh, I'm still a traditional martial artist, so I'm not trying to scare you away from it. But this one I call Once Upon a Time in China. This is basically the naturalistic fallacy, and it has so permeated uh, traditional martial arts that, uh, you know, back in the day, um, air was medicine, and food made you live 200 years, and, uh, you know, <laughs> skills were astounding, everyone was in harmony with nature, and everything was perfect and idyllic. Uh, no, sorry. I mean, anybody, and I'm sure most of the people in this room have actually taken a look at actual history and have realized that, no, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, the average lifespan in China was something around 40 years old. Uh, times were tough back then, and we're all way better off and way softer than those people were. So, uh, but the, where this really gets insidious is that type of thinking spreads out from there into all these other things in popular culture. So, I can't tell you how many people have told me my Kung Fu is fake because I don't believe Chopra physics. Seriously? What does that have to even do with it? No, no, you, you know Kung Fu guy. You've got to believe this stuff. I've, I've gotten in huge arguments with people about GMO, you know. Uh, you wouldn't expect this to come up in a martial arts class, right? But, uh, you know, if you let your skeptic out of the bag, this fallacy has just so permeated that culture. You really do have to be careful. Um, and I'm not saying throw a bushel basket over your light. I'm just saying know what you're getting into because there are a lot. And I, of course, acupuncture, qigong, um, all of this other stuff, reiki. Yeah, yeah, traditional Chinese medicine, a huge part of it. And uh, believe me, I've burned a lot of bridges in my kung fu community, but that's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and now, before I let this go, I do want to throw out three cautions for a skeptic who might be going into martial arts. One, do not toss out the Buddha with the bathwater, okay? Uh, that would be the genetic fallacy or the fallacist fallacy. Pre-scientific paradigms often do the right thing just with a bad explanation. <laughs> I mean, these people who invented these systems back in the day were trying to get an edge. And they were trying anything and everything, and some of it worked, but without the advantage of modern science, they had to come up with something else to explain it. And a lot of schools cling to these explanations, even though we have better ones now, but that doesn't mean what they're doing is BS. So, you know, if you're in a Chinese martial arts class, for, let's say, just do a little translating in your head. When they say root, you think, oh, I need to lower my center of gravity. When they say, uh, when they say move chi to the Don Tian, you say, mm, I need to be aware of my center of gravity. You know, all these things are actually practical. They just have the festoonery of uh, ancient wisdom. Uh, number two, refrain from saying that shit would never work in the ring. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Even if it wouldn't, okay? There's all kinds of martial arts out there. Uh, Brent, you're an MMA guy and damn good at it, so let me ask you a question. How much of your valuable training time do you devote to putting a good hard push on somebody? Uh, not very often, I'd say. Right. So uh, that's because it's two guys in a ring under a rule set, and there's no reason to push each other around. You just make them angrier, right? Hey, come back here. You know, he'd bounce off the cage and kick you in the head, right? Uh, <laughs> But, you know, if you think pushes are completely ineffective, I feel like Archie Bunker here, then you've obviously never pushed anybody out a window, little girl, or into traffic, you know. 
if you're in a martial art that wants to create confusion in a group of ambushers and allow you time to do some Nike foo and get out of there, then pushing people into other people is actually a good strategy. And in the traditional art that I teach, we spend a significant amount of time setting that up. But would it work in the ring? Why no. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. So, um, and the other thing to look at here is actual self-defense is rare for the average person, and most of us are never going to be high-level sport competitors either. So, if you're doing any kind of decent martial art at all, you're getting huge self-defense benefits, right? Martial arts is a great exercise for, um, uh, it, it, it fits well with modern medical knowledge, you know, intermittent burst of intense activity, whether it's rounds or doing forms, all this stuff is really good for you. The other thing is, just by gaining self-confidence and a little fitness and alertness, you take yourself way down the scale of potential targets when you're out on the street. The more you do martial arts, the less people will mess with you because uh, most predatory violence is looking for an easy mark, right? And if you seem alert and fit, then people will leave you alone. Um, so that's about all I have to say on that one. Uh, the last one, and I'll do this quickly, is don't poison the sake. That's poisoning the well. Uh, don't automatically assume that a traditionalist should necessarily look like uh, you know, an MMA fighter in his prime. It's the fat Chinese cook that busts out the foo on you, right? The, <laughs> that stereotype is actually kind of true. There are a lot of people that do this intensely. They get older, they get middle-aged, they spread a little like me. They still can be really good teachers. So, and also, don't let a little bit of the woo around the edges throw you off. Decide for yourself what you're looking for out of a martial art. Go in with clear goals. And it'll be playing pretty quickly whether that person can help you with those goals or not. All right, thanks. Guys, guys, before we move on to the next round, I wanted to go back to your first fallacy, the, uh, the, wood, the wooden man. or The, the wooden the, dummy? The, yeah. the wooden dummy. And uh, SF Ziegler, or Z as we like to call you for short, so we're going to call you Z for, the, you, for the show. Uh, I was wondering if you had particular comment on that because I understand that you've been training people uh, using a series of uh, videos or over the internet, effectively, in which um, these, the, the students have been doing just that. They have not been practicing uh, in, in full contact with, with another person. Did you, did you want to elaborate on that at all? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, and today, to this day, uh, is an end of an experiment that uh, has been going on for uh, one year? About one and a half, about one and a half years. Um, I have been teaching a, a student, I, I live in Hawaii, and I've been teaching a student from Austin, Texas, uh, for about a year and a half. And today, I got to find out if it worked. And? Did it work? <laughs> Johnny, did it work? I think so. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked. It, it's really amazing. Um, you know, uh, so the distance the instruction is amazing. Okay. That's all yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> well, look, let me let me be clear about that first point. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do forms and, and learn structure and body mechanics, or it's not a bad thing to do push hands and learn proprioceptive, uh, you know, skills. All that's good. All I'm really saying is that if you pull up uh, if you pull up short of actual contact and that never occurs, then there's a problem. There may be a problem. There may be a problem. Depending, I'll qualify anyway. depending <laughs> if uh, uh, on the style of martial art that may depend on physical contact in order to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually, I, I would, I would say that all those things that you think are insignificant. I mean, again, I mean th those little exercises and techniques. You know, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit in, in in my presentation. For someone like me who was smaller in a heavy contact dojo. I actually really had to do those exercises very, very carefully because if I'm off even a little, it's not going to work. I can't muscle my way through it. All right. Well, great. Well, why don't we move on to round three and uh, keep things rolling here. Uh, a breaking board uh, demonstration. Uh, John, I think you're going to uh, take the lead on this. Please, please hold your applause until the... 
to the moment when something actually interesting happens. <laughs> Let me just uh, point this out. I am not here doing this because I am particularly good at breaking boards or anything else. I am not doing this because I am particularly impressive at this in any way. These are not in any sense impressive breaks. These are just, I'm just sort of demonstrating some of how the someone who is in fact as small and basically worthless as I am is still capable of doing this. Now because you're skeptics, I feel I need to do this. Uh, sir, have we ever met before this moment? Have <laughs> would you please inspect this board for the moment and assure yourself that it is, in fact, an actual board? It is not cut in any way. To no, no, that's right. Nothing is hidden inside. Anyway, it is, it is a very, very straightforward board, which I am now just going to, you know, just going to, to, to position this. Now, you'll notice I am looking at this. I'm sizing it up very carefully to see, ah, which where is the grain, because I want to make sure that I'm breaking it you know, with the grain, and I'm just, you know, just thinking about this. Uh, there are lots of different ways that people, uh, they said, can break it. They, they, they can, you know, they can punch. Um, there's the hammer fist sort of technique. Um, there's also just sort of a driving hand. But, you know, the thing is, if, if with a good board and with a basic fundamental knowledge of what you're doing about this, and if you have a lot of real confidence about this, is really, it's, it's basically fairly easy to be able to do this sort of thing. Really, it's not. Not impressive. This, now, now this thing, let me just also point out this. Remember I mentioned boards with knots in them. Um, this, uh, again, maybe you'll check that out then. Much more solid. Like much solid, yeah. Because, because it's, no, it's the same material. It's actually, it's, it's a length from the same big piece of lumber that was cut. It's just, this is what happens when you get knots in this. And it feels heavier and it's more solid. And I assure you, it would be much, much harder to break that way. Now, let me just. Just I check one other thing. One other thing. See now this, and and well, again I guess sir, have we ever met before this? Yes, we two met seconds ago. Just John. a moment ago. <laughs> so, so, something's wrong. Okay. So as you take a look at this piece of board here. Yes. Notice I do have a board. So, but it is also still is a it is a board like the other one, just like the other one in every possible way, except no, it's not. Um, no. Let me give you that board with the X on it and this other board. Hold them. No. <laughs> no, this, uh, no, that's interesting. It feels that way. Actually, here's the, here's the thing. I think this one is actually, would technically be a little bit lighter. Why is it lighter? Because even though it also is from the same batch of lumber, even though it came from the same big uh, board to start with, I baked it. I stuck it in an oven. Stuck it in an oven at a low heat for about an hour, which gave it time to dry out a bunch more of the moisture and to dry it out, which means that although it is, looks like a board, feels like a board, is a board in every possible way, it is a little bit more brittle than the other boards, which means that it's also a little bit easier to break, um, which would also be a little harder with one of the other ones. Sometimes people who are doing big demonstrations with boards and they want to make it look really, really impressive because they're bringing the boards themselves, it's been known to happen that they will bake them or put them in places where they will dry out a lot. And I have actually seen situations where people were setting up holding a board, and as they were holding the board for someone, it snapped in their hands. Wah, wah. So bear that in mind when you do see somebody who just manages to just go through some extraordinary pile of lumber like that, that maybe in some cases there's a little more going on that meets the eye. Um, Dave talked about the issue. So you don't have to break them individually. You can also just pile them up um, together. And again, you just want to try to make sure that you know, they are individually still good and that the grain actually still all lines up appropriately. And you know, if, I put, if we put spacers between these, this is actually easier. I, I've never actually done it with a spacer. But I mean, you know, you, even doubling up like this, again, if you have some experience and confidence with it, it's still. You guys hear how this is going to go? Uh, <laughs> again, not so very hard. And now, in the interest of absolutely pushing my luck too far, I'm going to now try to do this. These three. Um, but again, these are really not impressive breaks in any way. But it just shows you there's nothing going on here other than just the advantage of the physics. I am moving my hand really fast, and I am hitting it with things that are relatively hard and relatively stable. The boards are 
designed to give me the best possible leverage and everything else in this? Let me try a little slightly different. Let's see how this works. Nine, one, one. <laughs> So then that happened. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. We are up to round four, Jennifer Whitlett. So I have uh, spent 10 years when I was living in New York City uh, studying what I like to call Brooklyn Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> Probably less of a traditional, very self-defense oriented, very heavy contact dojo. And uh, when I first got into the martial arts, I would go on these rec martial arts discussion boards, and there would be all these arguments going on about whether size matters. And the big line was, all things being equal, the bigger, stronger person will win. You know, and I got very, very bent out of shape by this. You know, it's like, well, I don't think that's true. Then I actually got more advanced in martial arts and started getting hit and sit on and tossed around the room. And I thought, yeah, you know what? Size matters. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, I also was writing about physics, and this is when I got interested in like, some of the science behind martial arts. Um, I'm not going to go in deeply into the technical physics. If you're interested in that, uh, my book, The Physics of the Buffyverse, has an entire chapter on the physics of the fight um, using examples from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Buffy is a tiny, tiny little girl, and she like, beats up larger opponents all the time. How does she do this if size matters? The answer is she has superpowers. <laughs> um, <laughs> What if, you, what if you're like me and you don't have superpowers? Well, you, know, you, you have to first of all accept the reality of physics. And one of the big realities of physics is size matters. Mass is an important, huge part of the equation. Um, one of the first things I did when I started getting serious about jiu-jitsu was bulk up. I was roughly 30, 35 pounds heavier than I am now. Most of that was just solid muscle. I could like leg press 600 pounds. I mean, I was frightening. <laughs> Um, but I needed it, be, you know, just, just because I was going toe to toe against these 200, 220 pound guys all, all the time. And you know, I learned little tricks. I learned that if they were much bigger and out of shape, rather than go toe to toe, I just make them run around till they retired and then move in for a choke. Um, so the point is that, that I like to say is yes, size matters, but it's not the whole story. And in particular, certain physics principles. Um, most of the martial arts are based on these because, among other things, it's a way that a smaller person can gain the upper hand um, by, say, using your opponent's momentum against them. We were talking about some of the different ways. You talked about how when you're breaking the, bo the board, the board is in a way to give you the utmost leverage. And there are ways that you can use your weight even if you don't have a lot of body mass. You know, first of all, it's important the center is very, very important. You know, your hip abdominal region, that's, that's like roughly one third of your body weight. So a solid fighting stance, you know, is very important and almost everything you do in the martial arts comes from that center. Um, if you have trained at all in the martial arts, you know that, that there are little techniques like snapping the hips, like stepping forward while punching. This is basically a way to get some momentum to add to your mass in order to have, generate a little bit more uh, force. Um, you can use the spring principle. You can bend down and coil your knees and spring up and then you say with an upper elbow strike. And you can do what he did when he broke the board. He lifted his weight and he brought his elbow down on the board to break it when he was breaking three. Again, this is a way of using his weight in a way that is useful. Um, so earlier we were talking, uh, he was telling the story of a technique that was popular in the UFC where a guy would bounce off the cage into a spinning kick and knock out his opponent. Buffy actually did that in one of the episodes. She jumped onto a table to get some height in order to give herself some leverage. So these are all ways in which a smaller person can do well against an opponent, or at least gain the upper hand. My saying is, you know, yes, size matters, all things being equal, but it's important to remember that all things are never equal. It's kind of a spherical cow scenario. You know, if any of you know that, that reference in, in <laughs> physics, you know, there's what works in the lab under very carefully controlled conditions, and then there's the fact that when you're out in the real world or in the ring and you've got another person there, people are very unpredictable situations, a lot of confounding factors. Invariably, the fight goes to the person who gets the upper hand first, <laughs> um, or the first person to make a mistake. And I, ho I hope that maybe Brett can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I learned a lot by doing this. Um, but I also learned that even with all these wonderful techniques, there does come to be a point where you just don't have the mass. Um, you are going to hit that limit. 
Um, and it's, it's important to recognize that. It does not mean that you cannot excel at the martial arts. It does not mean that you should never try. Um, I spent a lot of time getting beaten, falling down, getting overwhelmed, but what I found was if I worked really, really hard on the fine things to get my technique down, every now and then I'd get it exactly right. The first time this happened, I was gra grappling with the, this much bigger, like 220 pound dude, and he was basically sitting on me, yeah, which is all he really had to do was sit on me and just wait out, for the, wait out the clock. Um, but somehow I managed to get some leverage in there and all of a sudden he just went flying off me. And we were both so shocked by this that we forgot to continue the fight. You know? <laughs> it was my first indication that leverage actually is very, very important. One of the things that I learned you know, about uh, hip throws is it's a basic lever and fulcrum principle, and I'm going to demonstrate it later on, where you're, use, you're basically creating, using your body to create uh, the fulcrum, and the other person's body becomes the lever, and it's, it's an essential physics principle that all you need to do is apply a little bit of torque, and they go right over. Um, and it is something that allows me to even just stand there and balance a much heavier person on my back. If they also happen to be giving me forward momentum, say if they're coming at me at a run or if they're swinging forward and stepping forward into a punch, they're going to go over like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's go through here. So that's what I'm probably going to be talking a little bit about is how to use these. Physics can give you, the understanding of physics principles does give you a superpower of sorts. It's not magic. It's entirely in keeping with skeptics. It's skepticism. It's how the world works, but it can give you an important edge. Um, I think trouble arises when, when you know you have a person who is much bigger and stronger and is also equally trained. Um, I, I, uh, any of you who have watched earlier Ultimate Fighting Championships, they did not have weight classes, but most professional fighters now do have weight classes because when you've got people of equal skill then size really does matter. You just cannot escape that. So if there's one myth that I think we can bust here that, that's clear, it's that one. It does not mean that you give up. It does not mean that a smaller person can't defend themselves against a larger one using martial arts. But you do need to recognize that you know, mass, respect it. Respect it a lot. So a uh, discussion from the other people here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, I mean, there's so many great points in there all, I mean, I, I think certainly just the point that there, a lot of what you said I think comes back to something, you know, certainly you, you hear good people in martial arts actually give at least good lip service to, which is that, that there is, there is no one sort of ultimate art, there is no one secret, there is no one thing that's going to work, that's going to work in all situations for all people. I mean, you really, it, it depends on who you are and how you train and what the situation is going to be. And there's a there's a huge range of, of situations in there in which you will apply. They, uh, there's a it was, it was great. There was a I think if you go into training in martial arts, it is really good to have a sense of what you want to get out of it because not everybody goes into it wanting to get out different things. And there was a there was I thought it was a, a great quote that I had seen um, was actually in, a, in an interview with Jet Li that had to be like I don't know 25 30 years ago at this point. And he was he was talking about that. Um, so they were asking him, you know, sort of the usual question of, "Oh, you're so fantastic! You know, if you were in a fight with, you know, Steven Seagal or or you know somebody else, would you know who would win?" <laughs> and and he was very smart about it. He said, "Listen, in the modern day, in, in the modern era, there are really only four reasons why anybody should study the, studying the martial arts. You do it um, for your your health and fitness." You can do it because you want to be a professional in the martial arts and you'd like to compete in tournaments and you'd like to teach. Uh, you can do it because you actually are a serious fighter and whether you're fighting professionally or because you are, you know, you're a soldier or need to fight seriously, you do it for that reason. Or you're an actor. He says, I'm an actor. He says, every one of those trains properly to a different end. Though I would agree that I think that in, in order to get sort of like the best spectrum things, it is always good for have a certain level of the, the rubber meets the road part of things of mm -hmm. you, you, you got to get dirty and hit somebody every once in a while and get hit. But well, there's an enormous yeah. amount that can come out yeah. of that even if it's not the center of, of what, you're, what you're training. Yeah, if you're not used to being hit, the first time you get punched is quite a shock. <laughs> and, you know, the first time you take that really hard fall and, get the, and you don't quite do the break fall right and you get the wind knocked out of you, it's a shock. 
and you know, the, that actually happened to me where I just, someone like threw me extra hard and I landed flat on my back and just, you could hear, you know, when, when you land hard enough and the, and the wind gets knocked out, you can actually hear a crack. <laughs> you know, people are, they, they're just like, oh my God, we broke her. You know? But apparently the first thing I said was, nice throw! <laughs> and they went, oh yeah, you're one of us. <laughs> but it's important to feel that because then if you're in a self-defense situation and God forbid someone strikes you, you're, you know, you're not going to get stunned by it because it can be stunning. You can just think, oh my God, I, I, it takes you a your body a moment to process. Um, so when you're used to getting hit, you actually are able to react a little bit faster. Jennifer, before we move on to a demonstration of what we're talking about right now, I wanted to get your opinion on something um, because I've heard it said, um, you know, martial arts is, a, um, is something that appeals to males, you know, rather than females who perhaps look at it as more of a outlet of violence rather, rather, than, rather than something else. What's been your experience in, in that regard? What is, can you um, elaborate? I, I, you know, I, there, there's a little bit of something to that, but I think it is more culturally based than anything. I certainly was one of the only women in my dojo, but uh, that was starting to change by the t I was only the second person in, woman in my style to get a black belt because the final black belt test was just so brutal. Um, it was two and a half hours of just getting the crap beaten out of you. Um, you know, and invariably you break something on your black belt test and they don't stop the test unless you're gushing. <laughs> so, and you just keep going. I mean, I had a fractured elbow, you know, three quarters of the way through and you just keep fighting and they ice it in between rounds. Um, but, and it's hard to watch, it's hard to get through, but it's also very, so I think it chases away a lot of women who maybe don't want that sort of thing. But um, in particular, I was in a Brooklyn dojo. There was, there, was, there was some cultural aspects there. To be a woman in that particular neighborhood was to have the big hair and the big nails and that sort of, that's not gonna cut it. <laughs> you cannot have those nails. So they were not, they were only used to a certain kind of woman. And, um, but, a lot of those women found that there was an aspect of themselves that they didn't think they were allowed to express. And once they saw other women doing it and doing well at it and holding their own, we got more and more women. And the, one of the ways that we did it was to have special Saturday sessions with the, just for women so that they, could, they didn't feel as intimidated, kind of break them in easy, and then when they were ready, they could move and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the guys and, and not be like cowed by that big macho culture. Because, I mean, let's face it, there's a little bit of a macho element there. Yes. And there's plenty of women like me who are fine with that. You know, I write about physics. You know, I'm around guys all the time. You know, I'm used to male-dominated environments. I'm a little bit of a bitch. So, you know, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, any woman, I think, can benefit from this. For me, it was a very empowering thing. I started walking differently and carrying myself differently, mm -hmm. and I got harassed less. I mean, it really made a huge difference um, in my confidence levels. You know, one little plug I'd like to throw in while we're on the subject for traditional martial arts because they take such a beating from the MMA crowd, lately, literally and figuratively, is that uh, when, when the physics is stacked against you, we will teach you how to stick a knife in somebody or hit them with a chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> not saying anybody else couldn't do that. But well, we, and we that's the thing. That I mean, the, the one thing I was allowed to do in my black belt test that the other guy, the guys were not was I was allowed to bite, and I only had to use it once. Um, but <laughs> but uh, how many people here are Game of Thrones fans? Uh, yeah, a lot of people. One or two, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's that scene in season one where Braun actually decides to be the champion for Tyrion and, 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 like, beats, and like beats the honorable soldier and the woman says, you do not fight with honor. He goes, no, he did. You know, <laughs> you know there's no such thing as a fair fight. That is exactly you know? right. And, and one of the most important things I learned was I can cheat. <laughs> you, know? you do what you can to survive if need be. Uh, let's move on. Round five. Jennifer, demonstration, please. All right. Um, Evan, if I can have you and your wife up. Absolutely. Remember, I was uh -oh, talking she's about. Off the glasses. This is going to get ugly. The hip throw. Um, <laughs> and I'm not gonna, we're not going to do anything particularly impressive here. What I want to basically demonstrate is the, the fundamental lever and principal fulcrum. And I will also want to demonstrate why all things are never equal. Because here we have these two lovely people, but their centers of mass, trust me, we practiced earlier, their centers of mass are completely different. Um, so I would need to use different techniques and adjust my body accordingly to throw either one of these. So I'm going to use Evan first. And when we practice this in the dojo, we're going to practice this. We're going to be facing each other. This is basically to teach the principle. 
I'm basically going to get him, break his balance forward. If this was an actual technique, he'd be stepping forward into a swing and I would be stepping in and it, I would use his momentum against him and then he would ideally go fly. Um, but the actual fulcrum principle, I don't actually even need that. I can just come in. I notice I'm going to turn in. I'm going to upchuck him here. He's heavier than I am. I can kind of hold him here indefinitely because I've got my feet are serving as the, as the fulcrum. He's the lever. And then I'm going to apply a torque. I've got my arm around his head here. All I really need to do at this point is I'm going to turn and I'm going to look away. He's going to land right in front of me. And from here, <laughs> I've got him. There's arm bars, there's chokes, there's all kinds of things. I could even just kneel on his head and he can't get up. So it's a very, very basic throw. Um, when it's done full speed, it's very impressive. I have not trained practically, you know, for like five or six years, so I'm not going to attempt it on someone I've just met. But I want to show what happens when I try and throw the fellow Jennifer. <laughs> this has nothing to do, by the way, with our relative masses, but look at the difference in height and where my center of mass falls and where her center of mass falls. I need to get much lower on her, and that's going to be hard on me. <laughs> So this is really, so, and this is an important thing. This is, why, this is why all things are never equal. I'm going to come in and look, this isn't going to work. This is where I was for Ethan. I need to get down here. And then I need to check her up and throw her over. It's actually much, much harder. Probably not the best technique to use on someone with a lower center of mass. What I'm more likely to do <laughs> we didn't practice this, Jen. <laughs> you know, because this is going to happen. It happens all the time. It happens sometimes even on a test. You're supposed to do this really fancy hip throw, and you don't quite get in deep enough. Your technique's a little off. We have a little way of getting around that. <laughs> I'm going to come in, and I, I just I don't have her. I'm going to put this back, and I'm just going to pop this up, and she's going to go over to the side. It's called a drop throw. Sorry, it's a little harder fall. Are you all right? Okay. <laughs> I should have warned her I, I was going to do that. Side break. I'm good. <laughs> so I've been known to just bring random people up from the audience to do this. We won't do that here unless there's someone who really wants to try it. No. Anyone who really want to try it? <laughs> Can we have you back, Evan? Yes. No, no, you're, no, you're going to throw him. I'm not going to throw you. Do you do martial arts? Oh, well, that, go count. sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> now, the idea was that I, I would get like these young girls or these young children who, who have never thrown somebody in their life. What? <laughs> it's all right. We'll skip that part. We get the, we get the point. <laughs> I, I, I think you've made, I definitely you've made you know, yeah, an I think, effective but I made the demonstration. Point. And, and it, the, the look on their faces when they realize that this stuff works you know, is, is wonderful because it really is about leverage more than anything else. And being able to, and, and the more you train, the better able you are to basically use your, your opponent's weight and momentum against him. And that's how it works. Excellent, Jennifer. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice round of applause, too, for my wife, Jennifer Bernstein. Thank you so much. Yeah, she puts up with a lot, believe me. <laughs> She's and a great ookie. I like her. <laughs> I was thrown by Jennifer Willette. I mean, that's just one of the highlights of my skeptic career, I'm telling you. It's wonderful. Round six, Brent Weedman, take it away. Hi, guys. Uh, I got to tell you, this, this, uh, this workshop here has made me kind of nervous, which for somebody who fights on television in his underwear is kind of a feat. Uh, it's, uh, I, I am, uh, I'm impressed and intimidated by the company that I hold, both up here and in the crowd, uh, all, all the minds in this room that have not been mushed up and bruised. Um, We're scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Neutral. Well, um, so I'm familiar with the, uh, the impression that most of you have of my sport, of mixed martial arts. And uh, it, it's largely uh, not a very positive one, and sometimes deservingly. I mean, we're all familiar with the, the cage fighting t-shirt bro that somehow finds his way into every bar, club, and restaurant in the country. Um, and these things, it's, it's, very, it's marketed very aggressively, and, and so it has kind of a, a bad taste in some people's mouths. However, uh, I'm here today to maybe change your mind a little bit. I'd like to talk about MMA as an example of the scientific method in action and submit to you that it's actually improved 
evidence-based thinking, at least in, in, as it relates to the martial arts. Um, throughout history, like we've talked about, the martial arts have been uh, very secretive. They've been shrouded in mystery, and they've been uh, many times closely guarded secrets passed down from, from master to pupil um, or student to, I mean, teacher to a small group of students. Uh, and it's so often the case with mystery uh, comes legend, comes folklore, comes rumor. Uh, and so it's hard to pin down a date when this really started to change. But I think we see in the last 150 years or so a lot more challenge matches uh, becoming the sort of experimentation of martial arts. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different examples of this. The one that maybe most of us are familiar with are the Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters uh, from South America, namely the Gracie family, I think is something that we've all heard. Um, the Gracie brothers famously took out a newspaper ad. If you want a broken arm, call this number. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not here to talk to, you know, whether that was right or wrong, but it was effective. They got lots of, uh, uh, lots of challenge matches with lots of traditional martial artists, uh, lots of very dogmatic fighters. Uh, and they got to practice or, you know, test what it is that they were practicing in the dojo and adjust the techniques accordingly. You also see this with the catch wrestlers from Great Britain. Uh, you also see this, uh, it, you know, we've been talking a lot about the traditional martial arts versus the, the, the modern martial arts or MMA or whatever. Uh, and and this, this concept is not unique to MMA. Masoyama was a karate master who, who made a whole new realm of martial arts, a whole new realm of karate that was full contact karate, uh, bringing out the challenge matches, talking to people that said, if I touch you here, it would kill you. And then you have a guy coming up like Masoyama who essentially says, okay, well, you touch me and I'll kick you and we'll see what happens. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so throughout this experimentation, uh, like happens so often, uh, these results yield a change in methodology. And um, this has really been pervasive throughout the martial arts culture. Uh, I lost my place here, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so the, the big thing that we see, I think, that, that is maybe surprising to some people is often called the judo paradox. Um, Jigaro Kano was the founder of judo. Uh, he founded it about uh, 160 years ago now. And judo came from traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu. Traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu focused a lot on uh, very dangerous, very deadly techniques, eye gouges, throat grabbing, and all sorts of, all sorts of things that you cannot practice with your friends. And Jigaro Kano uh, had a very interesting idea, and I would make a personal point to say, maybe one of the greatest ideas in the history of martial arts, which is, well, let's take out these dangerous, deadly techniques. Let's either de-emphasize them or completely remove them altogether. And then let's take this new safer, I'm gonna put that in parentheses, this new safer art, and let's practice it full speed. Uh, we've already touched on it a little bit today with the, 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 the wooden dummy argument. You know, if you punch and kick air, that's about what you're qualified to fight is air. Um, what started to happen was these, these now less deadly, so-called, arts were having greater success in their challenge matches against the more deadly traditional martial arts. Why? Because when we compete against each other at a full speed, under, uh, uh, with full effort, and most importantly, under the stress that comes with a combative interaction, uh, it's no longer a surprise to you when it happens. That's real. I had an instructor tell me um, when I was very, very young, and it made a huge impression on me, that everything that you do in the dojo is, is a theory, is a hypothesis, rather. Uh, it, it's all just an idea until somebody is trying to do it to you. And now that's real. And so what, when we've made the martial arts safer, uh, they actually became more effective. Uh, this year, the emphasis at TAM seems to be a, a sort of a call, of act, a call to action, you know, looking at the intersection between our sort of heady ideas and uh, some actual real cultural changes. And so I, I'd like to submit to you that there's been three major cultural changes uh, as a direct result of this type of thinking in the martial arts. The first one is the most obvious. And it's that mixed martial arts went from being a sideshow, a freak show, to being a mainstream uh, sport internationally. It's very, very well known. Um, it's the fa it's, you often hear it called the fastest growing sport in, uh, in America and, and, and indeed in the world. And 
that really is fueling this progression. Like we talked about before, uh, the good martial artists are changing their techniques as new ideas come to light. Uh, as you learn that old techniques aren't working quite so much, or maybe somebody's caught on to them and there's a better way. Um, it's also not always as straightforward as one technique is right and one technique is wrong, or one's good and one's bad. It's what's the best way for you? What's a better way for me to do something? Also, the way for me to do something is going to be a little different maybe than the way Jennifer does it. A lot of things play into that. We've already talked about body size, and we've talked about you know the way that you train, uh, the way that you see yourself as a fighter, obviously a striking primary striker is going to train differently and fight differently than a grappler is going to. So that's important. The second cultural shift we've seen is in the culture of the martial arts gym. Um, I, I, I'm not very old, but even 20 years ago, um, when I was very young, it wasn't uncommon everywhere that you'd go in the United States to see a traditional martial arts school on every corner. Uh, it was very, very big. Um, you think of, we think of the, the martial arts movies that were very popular in the 80s that I was obsessed with. Um, and uh, also, on like the wrestling side of things, uh, the sports side, you saw things like wrestling and boxing uh, at the lower level start to lose numbers. I'm not going to, you know, obviously wrestling was in the Olympics and professional boxing is a large sport. But at the entry level, you know, high school kids wrestling, high school kids in boxing programs, you, the numbers were not very good. A lot of wrestling programs dried up and died. Uh, today, it's almost the exact opposite. There's been a sort of widening of the gap. Now you go to every major city and there is a half dozen MMA gyms alone, not to mention the standalone Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the standalone kickboxing and boxing. There's been an enormous resurgence in wrestling even in my lifetime. In Kentucky, wrestling was almost where I'm from, by the way, is almost non-existent 15, 20 years ago. And now more and more programs are popping up all across the state. My high school, has a wrestling program. As recently as five or ten years after I, uh, about five years after I graduated, it still did not. So this is a, uh, a change that we're seeing. And I think that ties into the third change that we see, and that's that the average, the lay person, the average person on the street now has a more realistic expectation of combat. Um, it's becoming much more difficult for an instructor to dupe a student with mystical moves and and aligning their chakras and focusing your chi and the no-touch knockout and all of this stuff. You show this to the average 16-year-old male in America now, and by the way, the average 16-year-old American male is an MMA fan anymore, um, and they're going to look at it. And whether or not they've ever trained a day in their life, they're going to go, something's not right here. Something's not right. That doesn't add up to me. I don't think that seems very realistic. Spinning triple backflip kicks. They're going to look at that and say, I, I don't think so. <laughs> and any time that we see an increase in, in critical thinking and skepticism in society, I think we should all uh, consider that a, a small victory. Um, I said at the beginning of my talk that I was a little intimidated being here. You know, everybody I meet, it's doctor, lawyer, scientist, author, doctor, lawyer, scientist, author. Um, and, and here I am, the jock, right? It's, it's like high school all over again. Um, <laughs> But you know, I, I had an epiphany last night, and that's that all of us are here today because of a magician. <laughs> I, I think it takes all kinds. And my hope as an instructor is that I can talk to you know, younger guys. I, I have a lot of uh, adolescents, a lot of teenagers that, deal with, uh, that, uh, that tr I deal with, that train with me, also a lot of adults. But I would like to think that this critical eye that I'm teaching them, it's easy for me to teach them because fighting somebody is cool. Choking another guy is cool. So when I can teach a 15-year-old kid how to be critical, how to approach this with a skeptical eye and with a, with a, a mind for reality, not what, not what he wants reality to be, but what reality really is on the mat, what the truth is on the mat, um, that's going to trickle through in his life, I hope. That's going to show up in other places of his life. And if, uh, it's not a stretch to say, because I'm, a, I'm, a li I'm living proof of this, that the martial arts can become the framework of somebody's life. I started training, I've been told, roughly a week or two after I had walking down. Um, <laughs> my father was a martial artist. Uh, I started formal lessons at the age of three. At the age of five, my father uh, opened a school. The, le the rest is history. Um, I can't relate to statements like, well, I haven't trained in a few years and things like that, like most martial artists do, because I trained yesterday. And I'm going to train later today, probably. And I'll likely train tomorrow. This is just part of my life. And so the gift that I hope that I'm giving to some of these, especially these younger people, is that 
this can start, this uh, critical thinking can start to plug its way into the rest of their worldview. And so um, I, I would actually like to, to ask that maybe you guys give MMA a chance a little bit. You know, in a, in a room full of intelligent people, the odds are you're not going to find a receptive crowd to extreme cage fighting. Um, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sweet. But, already. Uh, but hopefully uh, you guys can see that, that, that MMA, in my mind, the way I see it, is really just a grand experiment. It's a big, beautiful, violent experiment. And what we're teaching is not how to fight, but how to think. And I think that that's an important thing. And I hope if you are considering studying some martial arts, I could care less if it's with me or if it's with my style or if it's whatever, but I'd encourage you to check that out um, and, and to not, not worry about how does my skepticism plug into my, my desire to learn some martial arts, especially if you want to go the traditional route. Um, I want you to take that skeptical mind to the martial arts and use it to hone, uh, to hone that eye that you, that you guys already have because you're here at TAM. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. We've got about 18 minutes left in this workshop, so I think we're going to just move along to the next round. Z, you're going to be talking about defining martial arts for us all. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, it seems as if the big problem with martial arts is really the definition, how we all define what martial arts is. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of different versions, uh, especially uh, entertainment, uh, sport, uh, fitness, health and fitness, self-defense. Uh, there's a lot of crossover often in these. And so our definitions tend to be pretty wishy-washy. I mean, really, if you look at the term martial arts, bullshit. I mean, come on, martial mm -hmm. means war and arts means like skill. So are any of us practicing war skills? Are we really? I don't think so. I really, uh, 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 400 years ago, the flintlock gun was invented and it pretty much sort of changed the, the way we fight. Um, so, uh, you know, I would be amiss if I uh, uh, were to come up here and didn't say this. My, sif my Sifu sees this, it would be, I'd uh, really get an earful if I didn't say this, so I'm going to say this. Um, all of your guys' martial arts suck. All right, with that said, I, uh, I started training when I was four years old, I'm 50 years old now. I love all the martial arts, and I, uh, I'm just very fortunate, uh, not just in martial arts, but in my life, I've been very fortunate with my instructors. I had Randy as my, uh, as my mentor as I was growing up. Uh, I had uh, a guy that trained alongside with Bruce Lee, trained me in martial arts. Uh, I'll stop there, but... Uh, you know, the defining, and I think as skeptics, we need to really get wordy. You know, we really need to, you know, kind of define these terms that we're using um, and not just sort of uh, assume. Uh, uh, so I, I'm going to assume martial arts, we're not thinking war skills, we're thinking in general, correct me if I'm wrong, health, developing health, fitness, and the second part is developing a self-defense. Now, if that's the real definition that we're all kind of going under, who would agree with that? Self-defense, fitness, yeah. pretty much everyone. Right. Okay. okay, so I, I've made a safe assumption. If that's the definition, then we still got a lot of work to do here. Because, uh, for instance, you have jujitsu, which uh, I don't know how many are somewhat familiar. If you watch MMA, you probably know what the guard is. 
Now, uh, as a self-defense person, the guard is frightening to me. I, I, as a jiu-jitsu player, I use the guard extensively. <laughs> but in real life, the guard uh, is a very dangerous thing. Uh, and as a mixed martial artist, uh, it's competition. The realm of competition is extremely different from the realm of real street fighting. Um, you had mentioned something regarding the, uh, the sport fighters were winning over the uh, self-defense fighters. Well, my first question is, were the self-defense fighters allowed to kill the sport <laughs> fighters? <laughs> because if not, then they're going to lose that competition. So uh, there's a lot going on. The Mook Jung, uh, uh, actually, am I starting to jump around? Yes, I am. So defi <laughs> defining what we're talking about is really important. I train in a martial art called Wing Chun. It was Bruce Lee's first martial art. And it was invented by a woman. To me, the concepts of Wing Chun come the closest to fulfilling the definition of martial arts because it's a martial art that was invented by a woman to beat up a man, a smaller woman beating up a bigger man. That is what the martial art says it does. That's its claim. If it doesn't do it, it's bullshit. And so, for instance, jujitsu. I share your pain. Uh, I love jujitsu. I can't stand it when a bigger guy won't play with me and will just crush me. It, it's, it's just a drag. I gotta go to the hospital. I gotta get surgeries done. Stitches. It's very expensive. Uh, you know? Uh, and here's another element. I'm gonna try not to bird hop, jump around because I'm world famous for that. See that? I just jumped around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, yeah. I want to go back. Just detail. Uh, Wing Chun, you say, what is Wing Chun? How, and in a word, what is Wing Chun? Detail. Wing Chun is detail. Uh, we have a form. It's pretty much the, the main thing that we do. Little form. Uh, and it's called Silum Tao. And Silum Tao means little mind fist. That still doesn't make any sense. So the translation really means detail. So really, when you're talking about Wing Chun, you're talking about detail, really small details. And I think that some of the details we really need to get right with here is defining our definitions. What are we claiming? What's our claim as a mar in each of our martial arts? And is our martial art fulfilling that claim? Um, I kind of think that uh, I've trained in a lot of martial arts and I've said if I had multiple lifetimes, I would train in each and every one of them. I, I have a deep respect for all martial arts. Um, but my training in martial arts has led me to Wing Chun simply because it allows me to fulfill the definition better than any of the other martial arts that I love. <laughs> so. Uh, another thing about a martial art I think that's important is that a mar martial art shouldn't create an arms race. This is a problem, I think. It's a huge problem in concept of how we think of martial arts. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, uh, if the martial art relies on a technique, then all it's going to take is knowledge of that technique and another technique to beat that technique. And so what we'll be playing here is a game of who can practice and learn the most techniques. Now, if that's the game you want to play, that's fine. That's wonderful. But let's kind of really understand what's going on here. Um, you know, 400, you, you had said something happened in martial arts. That what happened happened 400 years ago. 
400 years ago was significant to martial arts. 400 years ago, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, F equals MA, I believe. Um, Among other things. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? Among other things. <laughs> Among other things, thank you. Uh, 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 yeah. The molecule was discovered about 400 years ago. If I'm, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, around this age. Uh, there was the age of specialization. And this changed martial arts hugely, the flintlock gun. You no longer had to train in martial arts. You just hand it over the gun, point that, press, done. This really changed martial arts. And we now became specialists. As you were saying, jujitsu originally had eye gouges and stuff like that. Um, what's not really well known is Wing Chun has grappling. It's called Chi Na. It was invented well before, you know, all the, the uh, submission grappling arts. Uh, but we do have that element. But I, my guess is around 400 years ago or so, uh, it was also kind of taken out and we all started specializing. Um, Orson, I believe it was Orson Welles, again, correct me if I'm wrong, he said uh, that it was regarding the, generalize, uh, the general practitioner versus the specialty guy. I don't know the quote exactly. But he was saying how these specializations have created somewhat of an imbalance. And as a martial artist, I, I really agree with that. And it also kind of goes against what some of you have said regarding, uh, you know, well, you can't practice at all. Well, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're going to make sport of martial art, well, then, yeah, you're going to have to specialize and work within the rules and whatnot. Uh, if you're going to use martial art as a self-defense, you really do need to uh, work in all. And so now you say, well, then there we go, mixed martial arts. Well, you have to have a base martial art, and I'm sure you agree. Totally. Yeah. Uh, from your base, you then discover and reach out and look at what others are doing and see how that relates to what you're doing. But I say, please, as a martial artist, uh, unless, of course, you're a sport uh, martial artist or a uh, fictional practitioner of sorts, really try to be a general practitioner um, and really you know, try to do exactly what we say def uh, our definition is, which is to develop a practical self-defense and a method of sustainable fitness. Not a kind of fitness that, well, well you got to go to the hospital, get this fixed, uh, you're going to injure yourself, you're going to get kicked in the head a bunch of times. You know, this stuff, it, it's going to uh, lessen your quality of life, and I kind of don't feel as if that's our concept of what we want to do in martial arts. Well said. Very good. Thank you, Z. Thank you. Excellent. We've got one more quick round. I would love for uh, each of our panelists to just for a couple seconds uh, give you each a um, uh, word of wisdom to, uh, to sort of uh, part with today. And I think we might have a uh, time for uh, one or two questions after we're done here. So each of will starting with John, will take a few seconds. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's been great listening to what it's been great listening to what everybody's been saying, but really I think in a lot of ways the, the and I hope I'm not preempting the pearl of wisdom you were going to share on this, Jennifer, but I think really one of the great things I, I think that, that, that uh, you said today was I, I loved the entire idea that, you know, that science is your superpower. I think that is a great thing for people to be able to understand that you know, the, us, human beings are capable of doing so extraordinarily much when they're well informed about what is possible, by taking advantage of, of and informing ourselves about, about the underlying principles that make the universe work, the physics, the mechanics of our own body, by learning how to take advantage of that, it can be personally enriching and it can give us a greater grasp of, of, of 
capabilities we would never have imagined we would otherwise have thought we could make possible. But it takes a lot of the application. I think martial arts is one great route into that, but so too is science. Hey, one thing I want to say really quickly is I think it's great that what we're seeing here is the continual pushback and interplay of different forces. Uh, traditionalism got a little crazy for a while. <laughs> and MMA comes along and pushes it back out into the sunlight and sort of shows the holes in the emperor's clothes. But, you know, what is MMA composed of if not traditional techniques? Absolutely. So it really is just one big thing, as Z was saying. Uh, I mean, I, it's hard for somebody to specialize in everything under the sun. But it's good that all these forces are coming together. And what I think is great is that you've got people from all different walks that are able to sit at this table and all push in the same direction to bring more realism, reality, more thoughtfulness, and, uh, and improvement into martial arts. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just very glad to see that. In addition to the science as superpower, uh, is, is this on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I think one of the most important things that came out of my martial arts experience was, was learning how to fail. Um, the very first thing that you learn um, I, in my martial art, and I assume in most others, I mean, we basically spent three weeks on break falls before they even let me do any kind of technique. Before they even let me do anything, I had to get those break falls down. Because they basically said, you're going to be falling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get hit a lot. You're going to be failing a lot. How you respond to that failure determines whether or not you are going to succeed in this martial art. And that is actually true of life. And it is a lesson that I wish I had learned before the age of 30. It would have saved me a lot of grief. Uh, I'd just like to say that there's a, there's a common thread that you've heard tonight. I mean, uh, you, you see we've got Z and David coming from a, a little more of a traditional stance. And, in their approach to the martial arts. And, and Evan and Jennifer both discussed that, that self-defense really was like the main thrust of their martial arts experience. And obviously, at least in this point in my life, uh, the combat sports are the main thrust of my martial arts right now. But there's something that you've heard constantly, and that's that we're all a little, we're all a little weird in that we all like the contact. You kept hearing that over and over and over. And I think there's a really wonderful quote um, from a famous stick fighting gym that, it, that is a, a, applicable here. It's, it's higher consciousness through harder contact. Uh, <laughs> it's, something, it's something that I've always found true because I had a wonderful conversation last night about the very point where we said that when somebody, when a punch is whizzing past your head or when you're struggling with another, you know, grown man who's trying to choke you, there is nothing more real and there's nothing more right now than that moment. There's no tomorrow, there's no yesterday, there's no uh, bills to pay, there's no things to worry about. There's the guy choking you. There's the punch coming at you. And, um, you know, what are we all obsessed with if not reality? And I think finding these moments where, we, where the martial arts affords us this time to spend time in the now, in the right now, and to study this moment in, in its reality, not what we want it to be, but what it really is, I think it can only yield positive things in our lives. <laughs> Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Mia Zapata, uh, she was murdered uh, a few years ago. Um, she was strangled to death um, a, day, a day after I had talked with her, traded massages. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, another woman, a good friend of mine, uh, was uh, her, she was attacked. She uh, had her head split open. She showed me the pictures. You could see her skull from her eye all the way here of a, a guy that uh, just got on top of her and started beating her with a, a, ceram a statue and busted. Uh, she's, she's still um, you know, try, uh, trying to recover from that. Um, you know, martial arts can save your life, uh, and it can save your life in many ways. As you were saying, you, once you learn martial arts, you walk different. The human animal kingdom sees the way that you're walking, and do, it doesn't register re really consciously. It's one of those unconscious animal things. Um, I, uh, you've just been pro uh, prompted to 
if you're interested in martial arts, don't let the traditionalism or the woo scare you away. I'd kind of like to add a little bit to that, which is saying, go out and start asking if there are any secular martial arts out there. Is there a secular martial arts? Because we need a secular martial arts community. And I feel that this may be the very seeds of that, and I'm very honored to be part of that. And thank you, folks. Thank you.